Good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting of February 7th, 2018. We've got a few minor agenda items that we're gonna do quick and then I'll open the budget hearing and hopefully we'll go through that and we'll be moving right along. First, I'd ask you to join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Also, would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. It's good to see all the, everyone here this evening. I'm gonna pass over the approval of the minutes. We're gonna approve them at the next meeting. Old business regional agreement update. We met briefly the other night. We're coming close to the end of it. Um, the committee, the, the people that we hired uh, uh, coming back with some stronger language and we have to figure out a few things. We may be right to the end of it and then start bringing it to the different groups that have to approve it but we moved right through it pretty quickly. Um, like I said, it, it hadn't been updated in a long time, so a lot of, a lot of the stuff was pretty, pretty much a no-brainer of schools that are no longer in this district, and a lot of it was just policing it a little bit. Um, so we'll be bringing, you, bringing that forward at one of the next meetings within the next month or two. Do you wanna tell them when the next meeting is? The next meeting for the Regional yeah, Agreement yeah, Committee so is February 26th at six o'clock here in the library for anyone that would, would like to attend. McQuan, McQuan closing update. Um, Ruth, <coughs> you can start it. Uh, we, um, the most recent development, of course, was the town special town meeting that was held in Hanson on Monday evening, uh, probably a record town meeting in terms of length, lasting about 20 minutes. So I think everyone appreciated that and we greatly appreciate the support of the people who were in attendance from the town of Hanson because the money for the move was approved from free cash. So we're very grateful for that. It allows the project to really move on. Uh, we had a meeting this afternoon with all the members of our team who were working on it and work on the project will begin at the Indian Head School over February vacation. And step one is really the containment, abatement of the asbestos that is, and we know there's asbestos at Indian Head. We've dealt with that for a long, long time, but that will be the beginning of the project. This then follows through to the next special town meeting, which will be held in the town of Whitman on March 12th at 7.30 p.m. And this will be for the allocation of the remaining funds where we're um, cautiously optimistic that that will all work and we can move forward and then other work will be done during April vacation. Um, during the February vacation, we will be fine-tuning timelines. We will have a timeline that will be far more um, exact by the time we meet with facilities subcommittee um, on the 28th of February. So um, definitely progress is being made. Uh, we intend to be able to let teachers know where they're going to be to um, as soon as possible and sometime shortly after February vacation. So good progress being made and, and once again, very grateful um, to the folks of Hanson for their support. Questions from any of the committee members? Anyone else have any questions about McQuan? Okay. Superintendent search update. Well, the search committee worked very long and hard at paring down a group of, started out with 19 applicants. We have got down to the final three and we will be having the committee the school committee is going to be sending in questions to Michelle for anyone that has it, I'm reminding you. Please send in your questions to Michelle and then we will have, we're going to have interviews. We have to decide, we can do this this evening if we wanna do site visits with all three of the um, candidates. We also will probably have a brief executive session before the next committee meeting depending on we have to decide what questions we're gonna ask. Part of the issue is if you do the questions in an open meeting and then have the interviews done, the applicants will know the questions before you actually ask them. So we're gonna check and make sure that you can just look over the questions, then we will come right out and go right to interviewing the three candidates that evening. 
that will be the only thing on the agenda that evening. Um, we, ha we are down to the last three you candidates. Announce the three finalists? The three finalists are John M. Marcus from Northeastern, Jeffrey Simonak from Pembroke, and Kevin McNamara from Greenville, Rhode Island. So we have three candidates. Um, what's the committee's pleasure? Do you, ladies and gentlemen, think you want to do site visits? Yeah. yeah. It would be incumbent upon us to do that in background checks. Yeah. I have no objection to setting up site visits. Um, <laughs> depending well, on when they're scheduled, maybe um, I'll go, maybe not. That's fine. Has there any thought been given to the candidates coming here and touring the schools, or do we wait there for the final candidate to come and tour the schools? In other words, kind of do both, so we get a feel. I don't know. We can we could do that. Yeah, we've and done a variety of things over time um, where we've done site visits. I see Bill Tranter here this evening. Um, we did a site visit to Bellingham, and then he came to Hanson Middle School and met with groups as well. And I think that was, was really helpful um, to all of us. But I would recommend that you get it done before February vacation as best mm -hmm. you can so that you move forward and don't lose any finalists. Mm -hmm. that, that was, that, it's, it's a pretty- You can uh, do it pretty quick. quick. If these, these folks are interested in the position, <laughs> you also can't, well, the problem yeah. is you, you probably can't all go because right. once you have more than a quorum, it yeah. becomes a deliberation and you need to be careful about that. So it would need to be people who are available during the school day to be able to go. I guess what, what we were gonna do this evening is think, go ahead, Mike. Um, the, these candidates are, are, a lot of candidates right now, there's, there's very slim and they, they are currently interviewing in other districts That's true. as we speak. So I'd hate to lose any candidates by going any longer. I know it seems fast, but I mean, they're interviewing now at other schools. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we we found that out that some of the some of these candidates are at other are finalists in other districts. So, yeah, Kevin, is, is it possible for the um, for for a, um, a, a you don't have to actually formulate a subcommittee, but some representative portion of the school committee to actually do the site visits, rather than try to say, gee, does this work for all 10 of you? Oh, okay, Wait, only eight people and that stuff. Can go you know what, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, is it that needs to so, be a smaller group so that would So we should probably, that. like, decide how to okay. compose that group, like, have a site visit group. Who would like to do site go. visits during the day? I'll ask for volunteers. Fred, Dan? Next week. It's going to almost have to be, I would yeah. think. Yeah, it'll have to be next week. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Robbie? Depends on when you do it. Why don't you tell them when you can and then you can call them and they set it up? I mean. Mm -hmm. I will, Bob. Anyone else want to volunteer? Network Mike? Network. If you really need someone, I would, I would go. But um, me, I, I like to see people who haven't met the candidates maybe as well. A, a good mix. Yeah, with yeah that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Them to see because I, I, we kind of <coughs> I got a picture of what they're like. Um, right, you've already seen. Yeah. But um, if you need someone, I'll. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Boyce. Yeah. Uh, I so we don't need you on the ice of the dark. And pardon me. Well, availability Friday would be the day for me. Oh, I got a week from Any, this Friday. Yeah, Friday. this Friday or, Any, or that. Either Friday. Monday. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Any daytime issues with you, Mike? Oh, I'll see. Yeah. Fred? The back. Dan? Just, just got to know so I can scare, schedule it. Right. Okay, Michelle, Let's the ball is in your court. <laughs> if you can set them up, one or two up for a Friday, either Friday. Um, Timeline wise, I was hoping to do the live interviews a week from today meaning next Wednesday, but there are several things going on. Our current superintendent's not available. It's Valentine's Day. <laughs> I didn't think of it being Valentine's Day. Kevin has plans. I do. <laughs> so does that leave you out? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take everything to account nowadays, I guess. No, definitely. 
Michelle, could you contact the candidates and see if some sort of the availability and then we can get back to the members by email? Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Everybody I'm, okay? I'm out of the country next week, so, but obviously we gotta do what we gotta do. Yeah. Well, one advantage is you've had, you've had a chance to see the candidates, yeah. so. Okay. Um, and if, if you have any questions, please email them to Michelle so we can formulate the questions. We're thinking the last time we did eight questions on the search committee, we might do like five or six, depending on what this committee thinks, and then some follow-ups tapered to the candidate. I mean, if you have different things you might want to ask a specific candidate that wouldn't relate to them, when we did it in the search committee in order to keep it all the same, we asked the same questions of each candidate, but some of these questions might be specifically to a candidate, so keep that in mind, seeing as you know the last three. Yes. Are, we, are we planning on lining these interviews up on the same night? Yes. That's typically yes, what we've done. I would think you'd have to, because yeah. once really you ask it in an open meeting, yeah. you'd tip your hand to everyone else, so yeah. to give what everyone the same What we did nine years ago is yeah. that everybody waited okay. in the guidance office and then came in. That seemed to work out. The, the, it's like the Jerry Springer room where they can't hear. <laughs> yeah, it was fine. So you wouldn't, I don't know. Exactly. It worked out. It worked. It worked. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. We, yeah, Michelle, we have, will you those email two. those to everybody? Yeah. Any other questions before I move on? So when are you thinking of meeting with the Wednesday? Next one. Next I Wednesday. don't know how you're going to get site visits done and do that on Wednesday. Well, we can do the site visits afterwards. That's okay, right? No. I mean, I think you're going to decide the candidate at the final interviews. That's very typical. When I happens. agree with that. I think you should. That's going to be hard. Um, Let's. And I'll just put my two cents in. I'm not. I mean, I would rather have the candidates come here and meet with groups, whether it's teachers, whether it's SPED, whether it's principals, that kind of thing. I'd rather they come here and meet with them than me go to their school. So that, that's just me personally. I would rather have them meet our people and our parents and our you know, elected officials and things like that. So I'd rather bring them here Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to do that than us go to their sites. Maybe I'm way off base, but no. we've done it, but We've done both, you know. I agree with that. I, I, that's what I suggested. <clears throat> if we're going to be under the gun this way, then I'd much rather do that. So, Bob, I didn't hear what you said. I, I, I agree with that. That's what I sort of intimated when I spoke to try and do that instead of, or at least. <clears throat> I think both have value, but this is a committee decision, so <laughs> it appeared that everybody was fairly unanimous about go, having site visits. Alec? Do their current employers know that they're looking? Like, would they, how would they feel about that? Would they, they would their current schools know. be open to us going in there? That's what we'll set up to make sure that they ask. Ninety nine percent of the time, when they get to this point, okay. they are. Like a couple of them are already. The, the way I found out they're looking is to check other sites, and they were in finalists. So if it's up on the internet, everybody yeah, knows. Everybody. Kevin, I think it's most beneficial to us to to have those interviews next week and whatever the the visits whether they happen or not <coughs> that's all to help with that decision but I, I don't want us to postpone this into school vacation and to push it back another week after that <coughs> sort of thing i think i think having that deadline of next wednesday should dictate our decision with what we do in between now and wednesday so i think the, the most important part is let's get those interviews in on next wednesday if that's possible I, I sort opinion. of agree with, the, with getting the interviews done even. I mean, tomorrow when Michelle contacts the candidates, keep in mind, you're really only going, you're really only going to two sites, right? Because one of the candidates is the principal here. So you're not, you know, you're, well, you're really you, down to two. But hence my point, wouldn't you rather that <clears throat> all three of the candidates engage teachers, principals, parents, versus us going out and probably gonna go look at a school. Might talk to a couple of people on staff. I think, I, and it's just my point of view, I think, and I'm okay with doing all the interviews next Wednesday. That's perfectly fine with me. 
but since we're on a t very tight timeline now, I think it'd be more productive to again bring them to us and we set up tonight what we want to do whether whether there's three different groups that they talk to and they go from group to group to group for 30 45 minutes each on Monday night or Tuesday night and they make their way through or you know something like that but I would rather they engage our people than go us going to their building I think for a position of this importance you need to do both I've been involved in this for many many years and I have learned from going to site visits that you learn a tremendous amount about the candidate because what I've often done is I've said, you set up the site visit. Mm -hmm. You will learn a tremendous amount about the candidate by what that person has you look at, who the people are you talk to, what you see, and what you don't see. And it is extremely helpful. The second piece where you do the other, where you have them come here and meet with focus groups is equally important because you get a real sense of that person's interpersonal skills, how they work with people, and what you hear. I would recommend that you try, I mean, I, and I think you need to do a site visit with Jeff Simonak. Mm -hmm. You can do a site visit in your own district and those are also incredibly informative. What do you see? What don't you see? And of course, you've got a lot of inside knowledge here, which makes it a little different, but it's still important, especially when there's an inside candidate. I think if you could try to get to the Sharon schools and see John Marcus and try to get down to Lincoln, Rhode Island and see Kevin McNamara between now you know, and, and next week, that Monday. if they want the job badly enough, they're going to make it work. <coughs> um, the other Monday, piece is, Tuesday. Jeff, I'm sure will be able to make that work for you all. And then you could do some focus groups even on Wednesday with people who are available and then have your okay. meeting. Um, you know, I just think going to the site, you do learn a tremendous amount. You also learn if it's, they're only showing you the good things mm -hmm. or not. So, I've been on a bunch of site visits for, uh, for different things. and. Oh, believe me, I'm not. It's, I'm not against. No, it's a I little bit of work, it. but just, it's it's better. My whole done. thing is, is, I want the best bang for the buck because we've got, like, you've got five business days to do this. Or do you move your interviews to the 15th and get, do it on a Thursday instead of a Wednesday? Mm. You well, could, I mean, I'm not here for any of it, so. Well, okay. let's let's kind right. of leave it with yeah. Michelle's okay with capable hands yeah. of what she can set up. Yeah, yeah. I think. You have and then question. we'll determine that'll well, Monday, Tuesday. determine where, where we're going mm -hmm. when, Brett. Yes, I want to, Ruth said, two, we're looking at two visits right. off-site. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I think it's more important to try and do as much as we can to try and make, to make sure that we get it right, rather than to try oh, and... Oh, no question. Yeah. I agree. Can we do, Dan? Yeah, the, um, for this meeting next week for the interviews, what time do you think that would be? Probably five, six, and seven. Okay. Because no. if you go six, seven, and eight, too late, yeah. It's getting late. No, I just wanted to know if there was time, like what Robbie was saying, to have people meet these people before the interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could set up then focus groups see, then in the afternoon. Then you can question them then. You want them to talk to students, you've got to do it pretty much during mm -hmm. the school day. You could do that. Can we do... Can we do... Can we do... It, um, in, I'm from Whitman. Um, so I just want to point out um, from what I know from other districts that are going through this process right now, we are very ahead of this, the schedule. Um, that So I almost would recommend, of course, it's your decision, to possibly put off the interviews till after the week right after February break. Um, that way it gives the candidates time. I'm just thinking it's budget season right now. Um, there are many meetings that are happening, and if, the, if whichever candidates that are not part of, that don't end up, they still should be a part of their own budget process. So I just wanted to put that out there that this is um, an extremely busy time in school districts right now, um, and you are ahead of um, the process right now. So I just wanted to let you know that if you didn't already know that. Um, I also just wanna say that going on site <coughs> visit, even for an internal candidate, it is extremely telling. Um, from my experience, when you go and see them in action, as well as them coming to you, it's very informative. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Part of what she's saying is true, but part of the problem is one of the schools is picking the candidate, and it's also a candidate on our list. Mm -hmm. So if we wait until after vacation, 
we could end up in trouble with that candidate, Fred and then Bob. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to reiterate, that perhaps you didn't have that knowledge, but one of our candidates, and I believe that timeline is about two weeks now, two weeks yeah. out, so. Uh, that's problematic with one mm -hmm. of them. Bob? I mean, since there's only going to be <clears throat> two visits, could you possibly set up one for Monday and one for Tuesday? Well, what about Friday even? Friday. Well, yeah, Friday. Friday, but I mean, yeah. in other words, either Friday, Monday, or Tuesday, and that way it's, um, you, have the, you, have, you have the site visits done, yeah. at least. Yeah. And then we can decide if, if they want to come in, if we want them to come in here, they could come in maybe Wednesday. We do focus groups on Wednesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, I know the timeline's getting pushed. But you don't want to lose. But you don't want to lose a candidate. Right. And I, I only suggest that is because we, we, we filtered through a number of candidates and we come with our final three and I think it's it'd be the best thing to do is just to continue to move forward. Yeah. I agree. I think, I think it's important to keep all three candidates on the table for the committee. You know, if, if we put it off and we're down to two, mm -hmm. that makes it even more likely that we don't reach a consensus on one of them. That's very true. Mm -hmm. Dan, did you have another question? I'm no. sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just, uh, you know, to reiterate, even if we could do one Friday, uh, if we could do Friday, if the schedule ends up working with Michelle's great talents, that uh, we were able to do site <laughs> visits Friday and Monday, right. you could even do focus groups Tuesday and Wednesday, you know, to split it up a little as right. well. Michelle, would you please keep tomorrow, we'll see what we can do and you can email everybody. And keep in mind, you can't I'll, reply. I will, I will help her. We'll get it taken care of. You can't reply all because that is no. deliberating, so please do not reply all if you reply to Michelle. <laughs> Anything else about the candidates? Anything else you'd like to hear from them? I mean, if you do site visits and then you do an in-house visit and then they come here, I, I pretty much think you should have a general idea. Of, some of us, obviously, on this committee have already interviewed right. these candidates, so five of us have already seen all three of these. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Field trip requests. Yeah. The French Club, French Honor Society, will be going um, to Broadway in New York, to New York City to see Phantom of the Opera. They have four chaperones. There's about 45 students going. <laughs> They're asking uh, for a waiver of the nurse because emergency personnel is provided. I entertain a motion to accept. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. I believe that's our only request, unless you have something, Michelle, for a field trip other than that one. I might want to just mention this because it's kind of cool and important. We have a letter here from the Mass Music Educators Association to Mr. Gillander. Thank you for submitting a recording of your ensemble for the MMEA 2018 concert hours. There are a large number of applications and we are pleased to report that your ensemble, the Indian Head Guitar Ensemble, has been selected to perform at the 2018 MMEA conference. We congratulate you and your student on excellent performance recordings you submitted and the diligent work that went into preparing for this event. Your ensemble's performance is scheduled for Friday, March 2nd at 1.45 p.m. concert hour in the Plaza Ballroom at the Seaport Hotel in Boston. Please verify by replying to this email that your group will be participating. MMEA will provide you with a complimentary conference registration and your school will receive up to $500 to defray the cost of transportation for your ensemble. More logistical information will follow. Congratulations, sincerely, Ruth Dembrot. So that's a good thing. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool to be yeah. picked for that. They put a ton of work into it, so mm -hmm. congratulations to that group. Mm -hmm. Okay. We At the hour of 7.28, I'm going to open the public hearing for the FY 2018-2019 budget. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. And again, thank you everyone for coming. During this presentation, 
If anyone has a question, please put your hand up. If you don't see me, speak up the mic. And, and come to the mic and we'll uh, answer any questions as we go along because we've done, if you've been here before for these, there's a lot of numbers that are going to be thrown out there tonight. And if you have any questions, again, please stop us. Thank you. Drew? I think Christine? we want to invite our legislators to speak first. Josh, thank you for coming this evening. Do you have any good news for us, like a blank check? <laughs> I took that as I took that as a no, huh? <laughs> good evening, everyone. Uh, Josh Cutler. Um, wanted to acknowledge that I'm joined by uh, staff members from Representative Deal's office and Senator Brady and a Whitman Hanson grad, Mr. Branca. Um, so uh, we're, we're obviously we're in the middle of our budget process as well. I know you guys know that I come here every year, and you're well-versed, although I see some new faces, well-versed in the process. Um, there is some good news, though. Um, state revenues are running above benchmarks, a bunch above projections. So far this year, uh, well, actually just this past month for January, uh, the revenue figures were $158 million over benchmarks, over projections, which is very good news. For the year to date, uh, it's upwards of $800 million. So that's a significant increase. Now, uh, just don't want to get your hopes up too high. Part of this is because of the tax package that was passed in Congress and a lot of folks prepaying expenses um, at the end of December. So um, we're still in wait and see mode, but at least it is good news as opposed to coming up with, with kind of bad news. So that's uh, a change for the better. Uh, this year's consensus revenue forecast uh, had a, a number of 3.5 percent in terms of revenue growth. That's what the budget makers tell us. We can expect to see a new growth for uh, the state uh, in terms of revenues, um, which is a good number. Um, that in turn means that uh, under Governor Baker's budget, uh, local aid, uh, UGA, unrestricted general government aid, will go up by 3.5%. Obviously, the Chapter 70 formula is based on the formula. Um, we can talk about that, Fred, whenever, all night if you like. Um, and uh, the minimum per pupil <coughs> increment, which is what we really rely on, as you know, was set fairly low by the governor at, at $20 per pupil. <coughs> That's happened in the past, and in the past we've always been able to increase that number. Last year to 30, two years ago to 50. Um, you know, I'm optimistic that we'll see uh, an increase in that. I don't know how much it's going to be yet. The um, <coughs> Ways and Means hearings are underway. We had our first one this past week. The education one is coming up February 27th. Um, so as we get further along the lines, we'll, we'll have a better sense. <coughs> as in the, the case in past years, the House budget will come out in April. And then the Senate will have a <coughs> excuse me. The Senate will have a crack at it and try to improve upon our work, although I'm sure they can't. Um, but uh, so that's where we're at. So you know, I would say you know things are looking better, um, but don't expect any dramatic changes in Chapter 70 because of the way the fact that the formula is the formula and our enrollment is is actually dipped by a little bit. Um, having said that, what one of the things we'll do, and I don't want to take all your time. You know, you have a lot of folks here and, and a lot to get through. One of the things we've been active with, uh, with our regional school caucus, which has been more active this term, which I, is good, um, is Bill Rubin trying to build up momentum around some of the, I, would, I wouldn't call it peripheral, because I know how important it is to, to, to the schools, uh, things like regional school transportation, uh, trying to talk about that. We had a good discussion with the state auditor last week who came in and had a report. Um, there's some information in that in your packet. I encourage you to take a look. Uh, and there's a full report you can um, look at online. So trying to do that, try, there's some legislation that would help re regional schools that we're trying to work on as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a bit of momentum, I would say, in that direction. We have a new Ways and Means chairman this, uh, in the House side as well. Um, so it's shaping up as an interesting year, I would say. Um, happy to take questions. That's sort of the general report. Uh, the memo I gave you kind of gives you a little bit of a rundown on some of the things that I just talked about. Kevin. Yeah. Do you have anything on us about the circuit breaker? Issue? So, yeah, so um, Superintendent uh, uh, Ruth, uh, Superintendent Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> Ruth. Whitner, excuse me. Ruth. Ruth. Uh, was, uh, who, who, by the way, we're going to miss Dealey. She's been on, so on top of everything in my entire tenure here. Oh, I won't uh, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> and believe me. I'll still get these email messages next year, I'm sure. I um, stop caring just because I'm not. I'm here. sure you will not. I'm sure you not. And I appreciate your passion. Um, so, uh, I had reached out. For FY18, because I know um, because there was an extraordinary number of uh, circuit breaker uh, resources at the local level, what you expected to have has not materialized uh, because there's been a, a more more expenses. So we are uh, there will be a, a supplemental budget. Um, we do this annually. 
throughout the year. Sometimes there could be you know, several supplemental budgets. I don't know a precise date um, or the amount, but I can tell you there will be a supplemental budget and we will be making a big push for an increase to the circuit breaker. There's a letter, I didn't include it in all your packets, there's a letter that Ruth has um, that we submitted to Ways and Means um, right here asking for them to address that. And it was signed by page, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 reps in House Senators. So it's definitely an issue that's on the radar screen a lot of folks are concerned about. And I know we're gonna try to work to see some kind of solution there. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And I, I'm happy to send, send you a letter if you want. Send me, shoot me an email. Thank you. Before I cede my time, I um, wanted to just two quick notes. Uh, one is I have our, we have our annual student art show coming up. Um, this has been a, a great event. We've had some terrifically talented students for Women and Hansen that have entered in the past. Want to encourage everyone to do that. Any parents that are listening or students, um, we display all the students' artwork up at the State House, so that's a nice uh, thing. And I uh, wanted to give a shout out to uh, one of your students, Mark Benjamino, who uh, is an intern for me now and came up uh, last week to watch the governor's State of the State speech. Uh, it was a terrific kid, so uh, good job. <laughs> um, Branka, you want a quick, uh, want to let Rick jump in and, uh, and say a few words? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I just wanted to apologize on behalf of Senator Brady for not being able to be here tonight. Uh, unfortunately, he had a Democratic caucus that extended longer than he wanted to. Um, but if you have any questions or concerns pertaining to the Senate, and any budgetary questions, you can direct them at me. But other than that, I'm here to be seen and not heard. So right, go, go I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take my seat in the back of the bus. Anyone have any questions for Rick? Rick is a Whitman Hanson graduate, for anyone that may not know, that we're very proud of what he's right. doing with the senator and what, what you have been doing. Started with the rep. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Also, um, Jackie Del Bonus is here representing uh, Jeff yeah. Deal, and um, anything, Jackie, is there anything you want to say? Or you? Just a brief email. Uh, we have been in contact with the governor's office about the supplemental budget, and mm -hmm. as soon as I hear back, I'll send you an update on that as it is. <coughs> I can tell you a uh, quick anecdote. So uh, we have our annual meeting, or not annual, our regular meetings with the Senate and House chairs of the Ways and Means Committee, and so I had mine scheduled last week, and of course, Regional School of Transportation was on my list. But as I sat down to wait for my meeting, I was seated right next to Representative Deal. So we've talked, we both were chatting about this very meeting, and I can tell you that both of us were prioritizing uh, Regional School of Transportation among our many priorities. So I know Rep Deal and Senator Brady, we work as a good team here, and uh, just wanted to acknowledge that. So again, thank you. Thanks thank you. Question. And again, thank you all for coming. Also, I'd like to thank all the selectmen that are here this evening. They're dotted all over the place in the crowd. And we have town administrators here from both towns. And we have a lot of finance committee members. So thank you all for coming. I know this is a, a, a big number night for the district. And I, I want to thank you for all that you do for both of the towns. This is not an, uh, not an easy job. And you put in plenty of hours. So thank you for, on behalf of the committee. Okay. Right. okay um, we're going to begin with the budget book. Um, I want to thank our... Uh, our legislators for being here this evening. Clearly it is important to stay in contact with them because the state aid that we receive is extremely important to the Whitman Hansen budget, um, particularly regional transportation, uh, which they spoke to about this evening. The idea is that we should be reimbursed at 100%. We are not. Um, circuit breaker is the money that we receive to offset the high costs of out of district special ed tuitions. It should be reimbursed at 75%. It's currently around 65%. This is state aid that we really need at Whitman Hanson. Mm -hmm. In terms of Chapter 70, increasing the per pupil amount is also extremely important to us. We get a lot of Chapter 70 aid in Whitman Hanson, and we appreciate that, but clearly, um, the way, any way the state can help us, uh, we greatly appreciate that. And thank you for being here this evening. So um, we have put the budget together um, with the budget book, very similar uh, in the ways we've done it in the past. I'm going to go through it. Christine is here to answer questions, and I will be throwing different things back and forth to her. We also have our administrative team and leadership team. If you'd all just stand up so they can all see who you are. There they are. And, uh, and 
representatives from WHEA are here, as well as our, um, our teachers and parents. It's really important that you're here to learn more about our budget. As Bob said a few minutes ago, happy to answer any questions. And if you, this is only step one, which those of you who have been on this roller coaster with us for the last few years know that the numbers tonight are just a beginning. But we feel it's very important to express to you all what we see as the financial needs of the school system. So we're going to begin with section one. We'll go through this in a logical manner. Um, the executive summary provides two things for you. First of all is an opening letter, and this really highlights the priorities for this school year and describes how the budget book is put together. Following that is a much more detailed executive summary, which I'm not going to read to you this evening, but would like you to spend time going through and looking at. In terms of the letter, not only have I outlined for you how the book is laid out, but if you go to the second page of the letter, you will see the things that are going to be highlighted. One of the things that's different about this year's budget is that the issue of level services is rather unique this year, and that's because we're closing the McQuan School, which has really shifted funding away from McQuan, which will close, to the other buildings and also has moved programs. So as you go through the budget, you're going to see some increases that you're going to go, whoa, what happened here? But then you'll realize, oh, that's right. We're looking at six schools. We're not looking at seven schools anymore. In addition to that, we also worked long and hard with the leadership team and the administrative team and linked it to our strategic plan, looking at what are the things we absolutely believe we need to do above and beyond what we're doing this year. So this is not an exact level services budget. It's what I call a proposed budget. Um, the first priority you're going to hear about, and we'll get to this as we move through the sections, but I'd like you to be focused on this, is the issue of one-to-one -one devices. And in recent school committee meetings, we've been talking about how our 21st century students are being tested electronically. They need to learn and read and write electronically. It's very important that we have professional development for our staff so that they are teaching in new ways to help our students be successful. And Chad Peters couldn't be here with us this evening. He's ill, uh, but put together a section in this binder we'll go through, and he has put together a multi-year implementation plan. And we'll discuss that more in depth, but clearly we know this is an area Whitman Hansen needs to move forward on. Most of the devices and things we have are the product of spaghetti dinners, a variety of other fundraisers, and we've done a number of things, but we really believe that one-to-one -one devices need to be a part of the operating budget. Um, the other thing that you're going to hear about is a need for two special education inclusion teachers, one at the Hanson Middle School and one at the Whitman Middle School. Currently, we have inclusion teachers who work with our middle school students in the areas of mathematics and English language arts. We do not have the capacity to be able to provide inclusion services in history, social studies, and in science. And while Bill Tranter and George Farrow asked for two teachers for each school to do this, we really felt the increase in the budget could manage one. Clearly, if more funds became available, we'd answer, have two. But because science is a tested area, we really see that as a top priority that we need to have teachers with expertise and working with our children with special needs who are going to be taking high stakes tests in science when they get to high school that they're getting that good foundation in middle school. We've also added the position of one family liaison and this would be a person who would work in our elementary schools with our school psychologists, principals, assistant principals and also social work interns that we have through North River Collaborative to work with our families who need to know what is available in terms of community and state resources to support them and to help them. As you know, we've talked to you about the social emotional needs of our children. When we met as a leadership team and an administrative team, it came out so clearly that we cannot neglect that because we're seeing students come with many more concerns than we've seen in years gone by. We often talk about the students sitting in our schools now. It's not even the student who was there 10 years ago. So that piece has been in. It would be a shared position with the three schools. And the last um, priority is that we have the No Adam Science Program. 
very well received. Um, completely unsolicited, parents will come up to me and say, my child is more engaged in science than he or she has ever been. And we have been extremely fortunate that over $400,000 in science materials have been given with no strings attached to the Whitman Hanson Regional School District by the Gelfand Foundation to get science up and running in our elementary schools. But now it's the district's responsibility to be able to keep that program going. Uh, Pat Frazinger, who is the representative from Gelfand Foundation, is going to be coming in April to give us an, a, a time to properly thank her for the major donation that she's made to the district. Uh, we, those are the top priorities, and we've built those into the proposed budget. Um, the other things that are also high priorities for us are no-cost full-day kindergarten, consistent school opening times. In order to cut costs, we've staggered the times for the openings of Conley and Duval. However, if that could be realigned, it would certainly be a benefit for professional development time and also teaching and learning. Our foreign language program at the middle school consists of one teacher per school. That's clearly not comparable to area communities and what we believe the 21st century student needs. <coughs> instrumental music, I've said this probably um, year after year. We lost our instrumental music teacher uh, through retirement in 2007. That position was never replaced. Currently we're paying a small stipend uh, for a teacher to come in and work um, three mornings a week with our students. Professional development, we are uh, very, very low in what we're spending on that and then also the instrument, uh, instructional materials to align with the curriculum frameworks. Those are things you're going to hear as we go through the budget. Um, clearly, you can read the executive summary. That gets into the details that are behind our thinking. So are there any questions on section number one before we move on? And is there anyone from administrative team or leadership team who'd like to add to this, because I'm going to give you opportunity to do that as we go through. So, Kevin? For the, um, the family liaison for the elementary schools, is this sort of a scaling back of the request for social workers at all the elementary it schools? It is. Um, but it's we the also, same need, but it's, it's a the same less less need, of, yeah. but I think we're realistic enough to know that if we're going to be adding those positions, we need to do it gradually over time, because we're we just going to end up cutting them. for the next them. year. Yeah. Exactly. But I, uh, the other thing is we are extremely fortunate um, through North River Collaborative to have social work interns. So this year we've been, you've all met Dr. Denny Howley. She did a presentation um, to you in the fall. We, Denny's been uh, receiving some funds through our relationship with North River Collaborative to help keep that pulled together. But we only have her not even one day a week. So this would be a more, you know, direct way to provide yeah. services Monday through Friday. That's what it is. Yeah. And it could be a social worker, it could be a school adjustment counselor, but what we're really looking at is what you see in schools is we know what schools can do, but we really don't have anyone with real expertise on, well, how do we help a family apply for mass health? What are the community services that are out there that we can use to support our schools? So mm -hmm. that's sort of what our thinking is. Okay. Thank you. I promise I won't stop and ask questions throughout the whole thing. I actually can't stay the whole time. But I just wanted to, um, I keep hearing um, one for Whitman Middle, one for Hanson Middle. My understanding is even with the fifth grade coming up that um, to Hanson, that the population of Whitman Middle will still be larger. And I'm just wondering if it is addressed in here ratio of teacher to student rather than equity of numbers. I think it's very equitable and both George and Bill, are you talking about the inclusion teacher? I'm just talking about resources in general. We the inclusion brought it up for me, but I'm just talking about resources. Very mindful of that and making sure the resources are there. I don't know if either one of you want to address that, but you don't feel that it's inequitable, do you? Yeah, but, but there are cases where they have more people teaching wellness. They have, you know, we balance it by the, by the number, as best we can financially. But I don't think one is getting more at the expense of the other. We'd never get out of our meetings if that was the case, because they wouldn't let us out the door. Okay. Anyone else? Section two. This is really just to give you some historical background. This is very similar to the sections we've had in the past, but I think um, two things I want to draw your attention to. 
is that the most recent numbers from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on their website put the average per pupil expenditure, and this is FY15-16, at $15,545. Whitman Hansen's for the same time period was $11,815, a difference of over $3,700. And doing the math, that would mean our budget would be 60, over $62 million if we were at the state average. Clearly, we're around $48 million. Um, also, we wanted to track for you all um, uh, declining enrollment. This is something we've talked about a lot with the uh, closing of the McQuan School and primarily due to low birth rate. And I know Bob talked about that at the town meeting in Hanson on Monday night, but there's been a significant decline in just children available to go to school. And you can see clearly Whitman Hanson has been a part of that. And um, Rosman Doris, who isn't with us this evening, lives in Hull, and she was at a strategic planning meeting there last Wednesday night, and they're seeing the same thing in their public schools as well. So this is an, a general problem, but you can see we, um, are definitely have gone below 4,000 mm -hmm. students, and um, next year the projection at enrollment is 3846. Uh, Last year, when uh, Chad Peters is the one who always does the projections, he was only off by about 10 students. So these are, I think, in quite accurate um, pieces of information and important as we move forward and look at the budget. Um, on the next page, we've really broken down for you just what the Whitman Hansen budget looks like. And it's important for people to know that we are go through state audits, but we also go through private independent mm -hmm. audits. And every year, Christine and her team are required to put together this information. And annually, the state becomes more and more detailed in terms of what, what they want us to present. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what this chart means. Um, yeah, so this is broken down into 10 different categories. and. Well, we, uh, our, my office, the, the business office, by, in October, by October 1st, we, we have to re send into the Department of Education all the expenditures from, from whatever it was spent from, the LEA, the revolving, and that's how they, de they determine what our per pupil cost is for the year. So, um, and they, they're ever changing that. You'll see as we go through the budget tonight that the sum account numbers that you'll see that are a little bit skewed because DESI has changed how we're gonna report for 2018. Great, thank you, Christine. And if you look at the chart, you'll begin to see how Whitman Hansen compares with the state. And you'll also see that uh, most of our money goes to um, personnel. And that's the 42.4% for teachers. And then you can add up administration and instructional leadership. Um, clearly, we are significantly below the state average in professional development. That's been of concern to us and other things um, slightly below the state average. Uh, the one thing we always do star for you is the instructional materials, equipment, and technology because that includes our smart center copying contract, which certainly makes that seem that we're spending a tremendous amount of money on instructional materials, not necessarily the case, but that does include our copy center and our contract with Collegiate Press. Um, on also on uh, in section two is we broke down the expenditure per pupil, and these are just looking at in-district costs just to give you a sense of comparison. <coughs> what we tried to do here was show you the state average and also show you where Whitman Hanson stacks up with surrounding communities. So it just gives you a sense of where we are there. And that is section two, so happy to answer anything on background information. For those of you that weren't <clears throat> at the Hanson town meeting the other night, the, the declining in birth rate that Ruth was talking about, the information came from the Mass to Public Department of Health, and it was a 1990 to 2015 study, and it's 22.7% decline in birth rate. So that's why you're seeing across the state. And you're basically seeing it, I further looked at it a little bit more since the other night, because the numbers intrigued me. Nationally, birth rate is down, almost exactly the same. Some school populations are up, but they tend to be in the w western part of the country, California, Texas, some of that school population is up, but birth rate nationally is almost 22.7% nationally. It goes up and down depending on the demographics of the state, but it, it's pretty much that way. 
Hi, Don Byers Whitman. Can I make a comment about that? Because I think people might think right away, enrollment is down, why is this budget going up? So I think for me personally, I have two children at home. When they move on to college, my enrollment at my home is gonna be zero, but yet my homeowner's insurance might go up. My personal health insurance might go up. So I wanted to comment on that. Great, thank you. Okay, all set. Okay, the next section, section three, are grants and other funding sources. We include this in this book because we think it's important for you all to be aware that what it takes to operate the Whitman Hanson Regional School District is the operating budget, which is what we are essentially presenting tonight. But without the grants and other funding sources, we would be a much different school district. And we receive grants from the federal government. Those are our title grants. Also the grants that Kyle <coughs> Riley works with, with special education, we get a, a federal grant. We also get state grants, and there are state competitive grants, and also private competitive grants, and then of course, Gelfand Foundation, which we didn't even have to apply for. We were just able to get that funding. So I want you to take a look. There's a bar graph to indicate where we are with grants this year, and Christine and her team have uh, put together information on the grants that we have. Um, one of the most incredibly important grants we've had is the 21st Century Learning Communities Grant. We have had this grant for almost nine years. That, how lucky are we for that? This provides incredible after-school support for at-risk students. Maureen Leonard heads up that program now, works closely with Jeff Simonek in the high school, and we really get kids to graduate. Kids really do go on to four-year schools because of this program. This is federal money, and we continue to get it through everyone's hard hard work and efforts to make it work. This has been a grant that's been on the chopping block at the federal level, so um, we need to be very mindful. If you do see that's gonna happen, you certainly wanna contact legislators and, and let them know about that. Um, the other grants here are pretty typical to the, they're pretty typical to the, to the ones that we have. Um, clearly, if you go down, you'll see that we get quite a bit of money um, for special education. That's the 94-142 special ed grant. Um, almost a million dollars. This is used to fund a number of positions, uh, professionals, paraprofessionals. Without that money, it would be very difficult for our special education department. And then also our Title I grant. This is a, a grant that we get that provides academic support in English language arts and reading at Conley School, Duval School, and the Whitman Middle School. And Title IIA, we call teacher quality, that pays for a portion um, of a teacher, and we also use it for professional development. So over $1.7 million in grants, so about the same as last year. But I think most importantly is that without those grants, the, position, the positions that you see on page 15, we would not have. Right. Over 85 people in the Whitman Hanson Regional, 88 people in the Whitman Hanson Regional School District are paid for by grants. That, means a lot. Um, clearly, um, 12 and a half through the special ed grant, three more paraprofessionals, Title I, five people, and then the others are sort of one here and there. But these are uh, extremely important. If these federal grants are cut or reduced, um, that's a huge hit to the Whitman Hanson Regional School District, and that, <coughs> either, that needs to then get picked up by the operating budget. And I know we were talking about that um, Chrissy Pruitt and I, before the meeting started, that we've been told at the state level be very careful about funding positions from grants because the grant money could go away. And you can see how dependent we are on that. Mm -hmm. you know, Kyle, you have anything to say about the special ed grant? Because clearly that's an important part of your budget. It is, and if you really do notice those two lines, you'll see we dropped $10,000 from uh, 17 to 18. And the other one that, um, we kind of just glazed over briefly was the 274 grant, which is our professional development. We're already behind with professional development, uh, and that grant is usually about thirty-three to thirty-five thousand dollars. And uh, if you weren't in a school that was at least a level three district, uh, you weren't funded this year at all. So the expectation of thirty-five thousand dollars coming into the district this year to provide what I think is pretty worthwhile um, professional development for our staff. Uh, it comes out late anyway, so you start making plans for that and then find out that you get a zero. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, cohort that I work with, the special ed folks, 
uh, it was a surprise to everyone. Um, and I understand, and I could be a little off on these facts, but that uh, traditionally Massachusetts get about um, $7 million for that particular grant. It was reduced down to like five, <coughs> give or take. So the state decided, um, Bessie's decided to split that up through the, the schools of their concern for most need um, being level three to four or five districts. Thank you. Any question on the grants before we move on? Kevin? Yeah, the, the, the school choice number. Mm -hmm. um, how does, I'm just trying to, to, to follow how, how this goes. So it's, it's 5,000 per student is roughly the number. Um, but I see a number of 450,000. Is that special ed opting into the yeah, district? So, yeah, there is a- um, That's coming from? Yeah, there is additional um, money beyond the 5,000 depending mm -hmm. on the need of the child. Okay, so, yeah. that, so, so, um, so it's not going to be a straight, right? Yeah. Straight right. 5, so, so we have, we have special ed students opting into our district yes, to receive yes. our services yeah. and that's yeah. where that's you're, coming you're, from. When, when students yeah. wish to come, you accept them oh, of unless course. you have, don't yeah. have room. Right. I mean, that's, that's how it works. Right. Right. Yeah. Currently, is, is that offset by a certain number of students opting out of the district? Uh, we have a few, um, you, I think the numbers are here, about $60,000. Right, 60000 So yeah. it's like about a net of three ninety dollars or something. Yeah, so about that. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Um, currently there are, and we do have some information on school choice here. This is something voted annually by the school committee. We'll be doing that um, within the next couple of months. At this point in time, there are 61 school choice students here at the high school. Because of enrollment changes, um, this has worked out well for us. Um, in addition to that, what has worked out, I think, extremely well with school choice, and is probably, I don't know what portion of this, but it's a significant one, is we often have students whose families move, while well, the students are in high school, they don't move tr tremendously far from Whitman or Hanson, and as long as the families are willing to provide transportation, we will allow the student to remain through high school, and it can be very traumatic to a high school student to have the family up and move during the middle of junior year. So we've been able to keep students because of that and I think that's been a, a real value added piece of having this. And we will talk more about school choices as the school year goes on, but I wanted to give you the information uh, with that as well. And Kevin, thank you for the yes, question about sure. special ed. That was really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of what you see in here really is just um, background information describing how all these things work and you can certainly read that in your own time, but uh, we wanted to put that in as background information. So that is section three to give you a sense of uh, grants and other funding sources. This is money above and beyond, um, that we use above and beyond the operating budget. Now we're getting to the big section revenue. And this is the one that causes us the most challenge every single year. And what has happened here is I'm going to act first, actually I'm going to put, give this to Christine so she can talk about what these numbers mean that we have right now. Maybe just go right down. Okay. Let them know. So this, when you're looking at this revenue chart, it's level funded from last year. So you look at the Hanson and Whitman operating assessment. Um, there's a swing of the 54,699, which is about half of what it was last year. But this isn't taking. This is just leveling what they gave us for an assessment in the operation last year. The mandated, bu the non-mandated busing for each town, there's a, there's a chart uh, several pages in that explains that, why there's a little bit of a uh, change there. Um, also with the Hanson, the capital here at the high school, um, if you re remember uh, three years ago, we were able to refund or refinance the high school at a lower interest rate, so we're gonna see um, s s small increments of savings over the next 10 years on the interest. Um, then we have the capital technology, which is the, um, the virtualization. The virtualization, thank you. Virtualization that Hanson um, financed over five years. They have, um, the, after next, they will have two, they have three more years on that. Uh, the Medicaid reimbursement, I leveled at 100,000. Chapter 70 school aid, this was based on the governor's budget that came out at the end of January. The charter school reimbursement as well. The chapter 71 transportation as well. Um, I, the homeless transportation reimbursement, I believe we got just over $25,000 last year. So I've, I've actually leveled that as, as well. The interest income, uh, 
David Leary, um, and if you've been to any of the school committee meetings this year, we've already surpassed the 30,000, so he felt comfortable with the projected revenue from interest of 50,000 for next year. Um, we just talked about the circuit breaker. Uh, this year, we offset um, the special education cost by 750,000. I anticipate next year being able to um, offset by 735,000. So there's a little bit of decrease there. And of course, the excess and deficiency, uh, we took 750,000 to balance this year's budget. And we don't know, um, currently we have $936,000 in E&D. And you as a committee uh, will decide what or, or if, how much we'll use to offset the budget. Okay, thank you, Christine. And I just wanna call your attention, since we have some legislators still here, um, to charter school reimbursement. When you see the amount, actual was 160, projected from the governor's budget was 117,000. This is the reimbursement that we get that is the difference between the per pupil of our students to attend whatever charter school he or she attends and what our per pupil is. And it's, this is uh, less than 100%. So if they re reimbursed us 100% of the difference, that number would be up. But the governor's budget did not um, reimburse that at 100%. The average per pupil for the charters that most of our students go to is around $14,000 per pupil. Ours is 11 and change if you subtract the two, 3,000. The other thing that's happened as well is most of our students who do attend charter schools, Whitman and Hanson residents, go to South Shore Charter, which is in Norwell in the office park. They've expanded the school, and as a result, the number of students going to charter from Whitman and Hanson has expanded as well. Um, and they also offer no cost full day kindergarten, which we don't. Um, so that's been a concern. The other one is the homeless transportation reimbursement. What we get from the state, we appreciate. This was seen as a non-funded mandate by Suzanne Bump. Uh, the auditor, however, um, $25,000 is not 100% homeless transportation reimbursement. And we're required by state law to do this, and it is extremely expensive. So as we look at this, uh, we have some real concerns with some of the revenue at the state level, and just wanted to draw your attention to that. Um, circuit break, <coughs> we talked about a little bit earlier. Go on to the next. Yes, Fred. Uh, excess and deficiency. We transferred 750 last year, and we had approximately 1.3 at that time. How much did we put back? Uh, not quite five. So not just quite. about 450. 450. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's why we're not quite at a million. Yeah, the budgets are just tighter and tighter. So yeah. there's. So what's the balance in the ND right now? Right there, 9,300, 936,761. It's right there, see it? Okay. Yep. yep. So <clears throat> when we get to that, it's, it's, it's a good thing to discuss while we're here. When we get to that, for, this is for the committee members, but we've been hitting that for 750, 750, 750. Mm -hmm. If you hit that for 750 this year, and you have $936,000 in it, you better hope that nothing goes wrong or changes in the school district throughout the year so i'm it's just brunting mindful. you for right i i would probably yeah. recommend we don't hit that for anywhere near 750 no. this year so. you're going to see what the whole budget's out right. very shortly but think about yeah. that right and historically it was about 500 and we yeah. ratcheted and it up to 750 really right. the last couple of years enthusiastic <laughs> yes so, and fy15 uh, probably um, dial it back fy15 you took 565 yeah. Yeah. In FY16, you took 750. In 17, you took 950. And in 18, you took 750. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so, so we've become be more dependent on it. And now uh -huh. what's happening with very tight budgeting is we're not putting back, you know, the same we've, you know, that what's left over at the end of the year is not that big. So, anyway. Right. So, so the state isn't unexpectedly giving us more money very often, it seems. So. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's and um, next page, we just give you a bar graph to show you sort of what's happened to our budget <clears throat> over the last three years, what's happened with the contributions from both towns, Hanson and Whitman, and then you can see very clearly what's happened to Chapter 70 over the last three years. It's been essentially flat. Uh, the concern with that is that for many, many years when the <clears throat> district regionalized, that number went up very dramatically, and of course, 
since target share since 2007. It's been quite a level number since then. Um, the next thing you'll see is how the local <coughs> assessments have been divided up. As you know, it's based on the October 1 enrollment, so it's not nearly as dramatic swing as we've had in several years. Christine spoke to you about debt payment a few minutes ago, and if you turn to, where do you have that chart? Well, no, we'll get to that in a minute. So if you look at debt payment, this is what Christine was talking, this is for the high school? Yes. Okay, so we've got that piece. And then also virtualization, which she talked about, non-mandated transportation. And then you get to the actual piece on the operating assessment. Um, you'll see how it was divided up this year based on the enrollment compared to last year. And <coughs> then we give you a, an explanation in terms of required minimum spending, so you know what that would look like for our towns, and then target share. As you'll see as we go through this, that because our districts, our towns don't reach target share, we, re we receive about $4 million more in Chapter 70 than state computations believe we should be receiving. And we'll show you that as we go along, but that's what this target share means when you look at the, the numbers at the top of page 26. And then Christine and her team have put together the assessment schedule. So when this revenue was shown to you initially, flat revenue, it's what a 0% in the operating assessment paid by the town or taxes for schools would be. For each 1% increase in the assessment for schools, that adds another $200,000 in terms of revenue. Last year, the increase was about 8.5%. On the average, a little high, it was higher for Whitman, lower for Hanson due to the, the enrollment swing. We give you, um, in the next few pages, just some definitions in terms of how aid is calculated, chapter 70, and on page 28, you get a sense of Whitman Hansen's dependence on chapter 70. This chart shows the percentage of the foundation budget. This is not our operating budget, it's the foundation budget that Whitman Hansen receives in chapter 70 state aid. and it knocks you right between the eyes at 64.22%. So there still is a real, uh, state aid is still extremely important when it comes to revenue for the regional school district budget. The next page you see is a worksheet that was done uh, for us by Transportation uh, Director Diane Naughton to show our communities how non-mandated busing was calculated. Oh, Christine, you want to talk about that a little bit? Right. So I know it's a little bit small. Um, so the Transportation um, Department puts this together as a snapshot um, as of 11-30-2017. So if you look at um, the first column shows you the total number of students. The next column shows you the walk. They walk, no bus, or the parents pick up. Then you have the non-mandated children that are bus that live less than 1.5 miles from, the, um, from the, their schools. And then you have the mandated busing, which is the children that live over 1.5 miles. So how it's determined is take the number of children that are less than 1.5 miles and divide it by the town, Whitman. So the total uh, non-mandated non bus children is 986. Of that, 775 is Whitman, 211 is Hanson. So we, we come up with the, um, the percentage. So for FY19, for Whitman, it's 381,357, and Hanson is 103,828. Calculated every year as we do the budget. We've also provided enrollment information. You received this earlier in the school year as well. And then there is a chart provided for us by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And this actually provides detailed information in terms of what is the foundation budget, what is the required district comp uh, contribution, what is foundation aid. So when you look at that, due to calculations at the state level, our aid, Chapter 70 
should be $20,606,218 based on socioeconomics, based on a variety of factors that are taken into consideration. But truth be told, we get $24 million over $500,000 from the, in Chapter 70. This is why um, you know, if we get more per pupil, that's going to be money that we'll appreciate um, in regional transportation and circuit breaker. I think to expect a lot more in Chapter 70 is not going to happen. And this goes back to our whole concern about no cost full day kindergarten because the understanding was if we went to that, maybe we'd get more Chapter 70 money. And we've been told at the state level, don't expect that because you're already receiving more Chapter 70 money than the state believes you should be getting when they do the calculations. So we thought this chart really helped show everybody just exactly how things happen the way they do. Um, the next one is just a breakdown in terms of Chapter 70 aid. Um, Christine, maybe you want to talk to them about what yeah, th this is just, um, this comes right off the DESE website as well. It's the trends in Chapter 70 um, since 2012 to current. And if you look down, it's been pretty flat as you could, you could see in the chart that was shown earlier. So this is just showing you the trends over the last several years. So that essentially finishes the revenue part portion of the budget, but it certainly doesn't finish our discussions about that. And that's why I said this is just the first day of un, you know giving you this budget, but clearly the, that section of the binder is extremely important as we move on. So now, any questions on revenue before we move forward? Okay, here comes the budget. Current budget is $48,688,029. The proposed budget is $50,706,972. It's an increase of $2,018,943, or an increase of 4.1%. Uh, we then looked at the revenues at the estimated revenues, which were not the same for 2019, they don't match. And there is now a shortfall of $655,878, or a negative 1.34%. We then looked at what are the increased expenses, which you go back up to the uh, top rectangle, 2018943 the shortfall in revenue, and you must remember, this is with no increases in the local assessment at all, would be 655,878 with a projected uh, anticipated deficit at this point in time of $2,674,821. Christine, how does this compare to where we were last February when we presented the Last budget. Last February when we presented the budget, we were, uh, the shortfall was just over 2.7 million. So we're actually about $500,000 better than we were last year at this time. Okay, great. Any questions about this page? Everyone understand how we come up with the 2.6 million? The, the difference I think, Christine, is gonna be, it's a $500,000 difference, but if you hit A and uh, E and D, Right. For less than 750000 which I can already see the committee yep. talking right. about, you know, that's not going to come right. anywhere near need... what that shortfall that's right. comes yeah. to. So, so that's the deficit in those two figures you look at right out of the gate. That's why it's important to see that. Um, the next piece, we've really done a Q&A, which you can um, read on your own. I mean, the first is this increase typical. As you already know, if we were at the state average for per pupil, we would be at 62 million. So $50 million budget for a district this size is not out of line. Then of course, is this the final budget? Absolutely not, we all know that. Tremendous amount's gonna happen in the next six weeks. And then how does the budget process work? We're gonna have a whole bunch of meetings between now and mid-March, and by mid-March, we will have to then present what the budget will be so that it can be voted at town meetings. Mm -hmm. um, we were, thought it was important, because we knew this was gonna come up. Uh, as you know, we're closing a school. And as you know, when you close something, there should be cost savings. So what we've done for you is outline here, how does closing, a, uh, closing the school impact the budget? 
Some of the savings from closing the school are being realized this year. As you all know, Dr. Wilcox agreed, said she would be principal of two schools. I think there are probably some days when she questions her sanity about that decision, <laughs> but she's doing it and has done a terrific job. So that savings we actually were able to achieve this year. Um, there's some other savings as well that, that we actually, the consolidation of a special ed program at Indian Head is another savings that we had. And then there's some savings that we're going to be looking at as we move forward with the budget as well. Um, in addition to that, Christine has looked at the various utilities, technology, SJ maintenance, insurance. All of those need to be prorated because the building is actually going to be closed at the end of August, not at the end of June. So they're not full 12 month savings, but they're clearly savings that are there. So when we looked at these numbers, it looked to us that the savings was around $608,000. Um, there are you know, a variety of things. Some of this is not you know, a little hard to determine just what is the difference going to be. But clearly, taking a building offline definitely reduced costs. And that's been incorporated into this budget as well. As you can see, budget's still up. Just as Dawn told us a little while ago, in spite of closing schools, Got to remember, Maquan was only one seventh of the pie, so it's going to have an impact, but it's not going to be able to solve all of our our revenue issues as well. But it does cut costs and hopefully will allow us to do some things we've been wanting to do. So we're going to go through the budget. We're going to go through school by school. Um, after each one, we're happy to stop and answer any questions that you have. So the first budget we have is that for the Indian Head School. Now you will notice that this one is, this budget is up considerably by $977,063. But of course it is up because you've got the movement of the McQuan staff to the Indian Head School and all of the things that are involved in that move. So that's why that budget's up. No other reason that we're closing a school and moving some staff from the McQuan School to the Indian Head, clearly with the movement of the special ed programs, that's a little bit different too because some of those costs are being absorbed now by Hanson Middle School and also by the Duval School. So as we go through those budgets, you'll see changes in those as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have on the Indian Head School budget. So, okay. Kevin? Yeah, so Ruth, the, the increase is almost, I mean, almost entirely attributable to moving salaries from one building to the other. Yes. That's, the, okay. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Other than that, um, everything's pretty much the same. And then I just want to bring to your attention that I talked, uh, spoke earlier about the DESE regulations. If you look down to where it says um, the Indian Head Special Ed Teacher Salary, that is really, it's not down by 80000 because <coughs> you're just moving that expenditure to <coughs> Indian Head uh, Special Education speech. They want us to break that out now to, for reporting purposes. We used to purposes. lump them all together. So you'll see where it says Indian Head Special Education Teacher Salary, and Christine has noted it's down 80274 That's not because we lost a teacher. It's because that teacher is now Indian Head Sped Speech Salary. We never had a li specific line for that in the past. Each year we have to become, I think, more and more specific in our reporting. Right. I mean, that's they an they change it almost every year. This year, though, they've changed a lot of how we're reporting our expenditures, what categories. So, The next one is really easy. It's the McQuan budget. It goes from $2,006,099 to nothing. Any questions on the McQuan yeah. budget? That means we're saving all that money, right? No, Kevin's <laughs> it, 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 it's Kevin. just like what you saw, Kevin. The Indian head went up nine hundred thousand. That's part of the two. Yeah. No matter what, <laughs> running six buildings rather than seven will reduce costs. Mm. Um, the next one is the Conley budget. This one is not particularly impacted um, by the move. So increases really are from steps and lanes. One of the things that is happening is that uh, both. Uh, Karen Downey, principal at Conley, and Julie McKillop, principal at Duval, have been interested in having an additional duty aid in their schools. As a result of combining <coughs> the schools, we've been able to reassign their duty aids, one to each one of those schools. So that's why you'll see a little bump in that. Um, the other increase, um, and I can address um, 
have uh, Kyle Riley talk about that, is the TLC program, and that is our program, district-wide program for students who have significant uh, behavioral concerns. And maybe um, you can talk about why that's up. Sure. And uh, I think Karen's, yeah. <coughs> Unless Karen wants to, but the um, TLC program is, as you say, students with significant behavioral concerns. It was uh, a program that's a K-4 program that um, over this year looked at to be broken up. And so the state requires us to uh, not have students who are outside of 48 months of their date of birth in the same classroom. That's affected that way, but also they, a kindergartner and a fourth grader have very different needs uh, depending what that is. So it's a district program for that population that can be supported better in two classrooms with two teachers. In addition to that, we, as we mentioned earlier in talking about this family liaison position and also other concerns, unfortunately, we have more young children with greater problems mm -hmm. coming to the school system. Um, very dramatic, and, and this has definitely caused some changes in the TLC program. So that's the increase that you'll see there. Um, other than that, Conley is, is pretty much the same. Any questions on the Conley budget? Hey, thank you. Um, next is Duval School. As you know, the difference with Duval School is that they are now going to be the school that has the substan substantially separate special needs program for our elementary children. So the increases that you see there are going to be in uh, Duval Special Ed teacher's salary significant increase there, $136,000, and that is because there will be teachers going from the Indian Head School to, um, to the Duval School. So that's one of the changes that's happening there. And also paraprofessionals. So that's why that budget, that budget looks the way it does. Any questions there? Thank you. Okay, the next is Whitman Middle School. Um, you will see there is an increase of $26,482. That's, that makes sense, it's nice to see. Um, we have some savings in retirements and that certainly has helped reduce costs there. Um, other than that, um, we do hope to be able to add inclusion support at the Whitman Middle School uh, for our science programs. And even with the inclusion of that teacher into the budget, their budget is up just 20, over $26,000. So that's, other than that, no major changes at the Whitman Middle School. Questions there? Of course, Hanson Middle School is going to have the impact of the fifth grade um, moving to the Hanson Middle School, so you're going to see those teacher salaries go up. Um, you have five fifth grade teachers that would have been in the um, Indian Head budget have now moved to the Hanson Middle School budget. That's uh, one of the big changes there. And you're going to also see that in special ed salary as you have programs moving for our students. And um, Kyle just talked about ages and having to, to look at that. So that's going to be the increase there. So you see they are up a half a million dollars, but that is the movement of, of the fifth grade to the Hanson Middle School and the special ed programs mm -hmm. that accompany that. In addition to that, they are adding, and we'd like to add an inclusion teacher to help with middle school students in their sciences. Okay. And the high school budget, that's a big one. Um, you'll see there is a change in salary of 165,000. Um, that is really steps and lanes. Um, that's really a salary increase. It's no new positions, nothing like that, but um, that's what that increase is right there. Other than that, there actually you'll see there are some decreases. Um, they have a student who's graduating, that's reducing some of the special ed costs. Um, other than that, the, the main changes are just uh, salary increases. And they have a big staff, so that's why you're gonna see a, a bigger number there than you would see in the other schools. Um, District-wide, you can see the school committee doesn't cost us much money, so that's good. You have no increases at all. <laughs> um, then we also get into um, Superintendent's uh, salaries, we, this year we have an unfunded, um, essentially unfunded position of assistant superintendent um, with the resignation of Pat Dillon at the beginning of the school year. Uh, Rosamond Dorrance is doing the interim at a significant 
uh, reduction in cost. And as a result of that, you'll see, um, you know, that's going to be in the budget. We have to um, address that. Other increase is one in legal services. And Christine, maybe you can talk about that. Yes, the yeah. um, ACA requirements is um, a lot of work. So we, we, only, we need to um, subcontract some of that out with the help of the business office. So we want to make sure that we have enough in there to support that. Okay, great. Um, the other is teaching and learning. No big changes there. Um, and that, those pieces. Um, District-wide, um, we put principal salaries in. You can see that. Um, there are some changes, and, and those are a result of also the reporting that's required by DESI, and Christine, why don't you address those? Right, so. This is on page 46. Yep. So the, last year we reported the curriculum directors in the, that district-wide principal slash administrative salary line, and now DESI's requiring us to report it on their own uh, separate line. So you'll see that it looks like the principal salary is down and the <coughs> curriculum directors is up. But it's a, it's actually a wash, besides the increases in the, in their contracts. Right. So that looks more dramatic than it really right. is. That's exactly right. Um, the other thing that is different with this budget this year is that the preschool budget was included with McQuan when you saw last year's budget. Um, it probably should have been district wide all along because it is a district wide program. I think it's clearer to see exactly what it is. So PK has now been added as a district-wide um, salary uh, line item rather than a McQuan or, or, you know, in the past it was also at Conley or different places. Um, so it's now being carried as a district, um, district line budget, and I think that's more transparent anyway in terms of what we're doing. Um, no other real significant increases in, in costs in those district-wide ones on 46. If you move to page 47, um, school choice, which is what we are paying out, so that answers your question in terms of what do we pay out for school choice, and a, a big concern with charter schools. Our charter school assessment has gone up dramatically uh, based on the governor's budget, and this is largely because of the expansion of South Shore Charter School. So we went from about 30 charter school students most of them at South Shore Charter to over 40 charter school students because they've expanded the program. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a, a big cost to us that we really were very surprised to see. And I know you called up at the DESI to see what, what was going on here. Right, right, yeah, and they said exactly what you just said is the big expansion at the um, South Shore Charter. The yeah. South Shore Charter. So um, it's just increased and they're anticipating they right now they're anticipating for this year that we're going to have 54 students there All right um, the next piece you'll see is the technology budget um, unfortunately chad can't be here this evening to talk about it but what we've been working on with tech services really over the last several years is they used to have enough line items to cover an entire page which made it very difficult to actually figure out where all the money was going. So uh, Christine has worked with Chad Peters to consolidate their lines, and if you could speak to those, I think that sure. would be helpful. Uh, we consolidated some last year, and we consolidated some more this year, so you'll see um, where there's, you know, 149,000 minus, minus 27.5, that's incorporated in um, other accounts. So if you look down, you'll look at, um, tech services, contracted services, it looks like it's up 195, but what, what he's done is consolidated all of his accounts. And then if you also look at one of the salary lines um, is up by 56,000. Um, it's not really up by 56,000. It's the 50,000 that we will no longer be getting with the contract from the town of Hanson. So we have to put that back into the LEA budget since we don't have the contract with them for next year. And the other increase that you'll see is the very last one, and that's the $40,000, which would be the beginning of a multi-year one-to-one device plan. So that's the 40000 that you'll see right at the bottom there. Um, the next, um, you have athletics. Um, we then get into clinic. No major um, changes there from, from what we've had last year. Um, Christine, maybe if you talk about the, the ones that really impact the... Uh, business office. Too. Okay, so 
Um, the salary reserve, um, that's an increase with anticipated buyouts um, for when our people retire next year. Um, they don't need to tell us until June, so it's very hard to, it's very difficult to, to budget to what we're going to have to pay them when they leave. So we increased that very conservatively at 56000 um, The next one down is those, the retirement assessments that I've talked about before. Um, the GIC is for all our DESE licensed um, personnel that have retired. That pays for their health insurance. There actually is a decrease in that assessment. And then Plymouth County, there was um, a slight increase, so they actually offset, offset each other. It's actually a decrease of just over $9,000. Um, of course, Medicare, salaries go up, Medicare goes up. Um, the health insurance, um, very conservative number. Uh, the, Mar the March 7th meeting, the member towns are going to vote on and set the actual um, increase. It's looking that it's going to be, you know, about 7% or so. Um, we have the district-wide um, psycho psychologist that came from Aquan. Now we put that in um, the district-wide. Um, that's about it. We had a person, uh, you'll see the previous re uh, report that we move one person from one line to another. Right, and just to address the district-wide psych, um, one of the things that has come with the move and with closing Maquan is that we still have the same number of children and they still have the same number of needs. We just have one less building. So reducing a school psychologist or a school nurse, which we will be reducing by about 0.5, but not whole positions, are that the number of people who need services are still there. We just have one less building to operate. So that we put that position as district-wide and I know Kyle's been working with the school psychologist to develop a plan as to what that's going to look like. We also see that as working very closely with this um, family liaison at the elementary level in providing sp support services as well. So those are ways we're starting to move forward in trying to address these social emotional learning needs um, of our students. And um, so that's, that's why that position is now listed as district wide. Okay, the next, uh, we're coming up to the special ed budget, and uh, Kyle, you want to talk about that a little bit for us, please? Sure, I think you started touching on it um, in regards to, I'm still on 48, is that where you are? Mm-hmm. So I am, um, I think the reclassification of clerical salary, um, that is from the business office. Uh, we did have someone in, on staff, it's not a new position, someone who ended up, their duties became more and more part of student services than they were in business, so we did shift that over to the student services like ELL, um, uh, homeschooling, things, things such as that. Um, so I, I would think the only, um, the next significant piece uh, outside of transportation uh, increase would be tuition, uh, which is always something you know, we try to keep as tight as we can. Uh, it's that, as I talk about picking, uh, I first started in special ed, someone told me the budget for special ed is like picking up jello with a fork. Uh, that is a pretty good assessment of what it is. Just when you think, I've walked into Christine's office and Ruth's office this year and said, I know we're over 200,000, we brought someone back, we're in better shape, only to find out two weeks later someone else has moved in that has another cost altogether. So. Very volatile, uh, very back and forth. We keep it as tight as we can. We try uh, in-house to um, develop programs, as we've talked about a little bit already, to capture some of those kids and keep them in the community. Uh, certainly the finance piece of it is important, but more importantly is uh, kids from Whitman Hanson are, are learning in their community as much as possible and keep them in district with their, their peers. So uh, I think in that line, uh, although there's a, um, Increase to 340,000. If you went back for three years, you'd see the increase is actually less from uh, 18 to 19 than it was 17 to 18. So it's, it's really just trying to keep that as close as possible. Um, but that's a number that will continue to grow with the more um, mental health issues we have out there across the Commonwealth and across the nation. Uh, and we try to control those with services inside. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Kevin? Yes, Kyle, uh, I didn't quite follow. What's the explanation for the clerical salary going up uh, 64000 well, I, I think you, it's a you explained it, but I didn't quite. It's a reassignment really from the, make it simple, from the business office, someone who is 
technically on paper assigned to the business office oh, is okay. now assigned student services. So it's like a shift from it's one. Shift. It really it's is. Not she not does a, registrar. She does the. Uh -huh. It's all student service thing. Yeah. So as you um, change my title, be more than special ed, make it student services. Uh, it really did line up with some of the job uh, things that she did lined up more into me than Christine at that point. Yeah, I get you. So if you yeah. look at page yeah. forty-five, Kevin. Yep. Um, under uh, business services clerical salary, you'll see that that went down. There's a negative. Yes, a negative. Yeah, that's the negative. Gotcha. It's the same person, just <laughs> different uh, roles and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the other increase you'll see is also district-wide transportation. That's our contract with first student. It's up 4%, what it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an increase that you'll see as well. And then we get to facilities and um, <clears throat> Clearly there are some, there is a decrease, probably the biggest one is that we won't have to clean Maquan, um, and that's a decrease of $70,000. So those are, you can see, these are where all the Maquan closings come into play and the numbers that we talked about um, in terms of reduced costs earlier <coughs> in the evening. So you can get a sense of where those numbers actually came from. And I believe, is that it? That's it. Yes. Okay, that is the proposed budget, and we are um, happy to answer any questions about that. Question. Yes. Um, in, in my opinion, charter schools certainly are not our friends in any way. And I'm just wondering, um, do we do any exit interviews to find out why? They never they come in the first place. They never come in the so first place. They're, they're leaving right from home? Yes. So when I sense. analyzed it, and I haven't analyzed it this year, uh, but when I analyzed it a uh, year or so ago, there, were, there was only one child who'd ever even come to Whitman. So I'm assuming that the free kindergarten is a, is a big draw? I mean, I don't know. Location, I mean, who knows? They have to provide transportation. Um, I don't know, but that could be, could be a factor. So we don't really know why? Maybe lots of reasons, I would think. But clearly, no cost full day kindergarten saves people money. Um, yeah. Thank you. But ver they very rarely have made a choice not to come here because they've ever been here. So. Well, I just, I didn't know if there was somewhere in the community as to, as to find out how and why they choose to go there as opposed to. I don't know. I mean, in terms of yeah. student achievement and everything, we're at least comparable or maybe even do better sometimes. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, it's, I think there are probably many, many reasons why people do it. One down. I actually have a little bit of insight on that. My sister lives um, in another town and she, immediately chose to send her daughter to a charter school. Um, there were so many more programs that were available for her daughter. Um, she was there till like four o'clock in the afternoon with all these special added programs that she can get for free. Um, in the free kindergarten, of course, too. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, Steve. Ruthie, are we under, I hate to say it, but a budget freeze? Yes. When it comes to supplies or whatever? Yes. Right now we are, And yep. how much would that might project out in four and a half months left of the current fiscal year? Any idea? I'm not sure what you mean. How much do you think our savings would be? I mean, it's certainly, I think you look at that. It's hard to project because we haven't gotten through the winter. Right? Okay. And one of that's the concerns, and I know this was talking to Ernie just <coughs> earlier today, is that the little storms that we've had, like the one around lunchtime today or the two last week, end up costing almost as much as those blizzards three years ago because they're so annoying and yeah. you've got to get out there <laughs> mm -hmm. and do all these things. So I that's think true. we really need to get through the winter. We had some very, very cold, cold days, unusually cold, so mm -hmm. the heating costs are another reason um, that we looked at that. Um, so I, I think we'll know better, but clearly we want to be able to put some money back into excess and deficiency at the end of the year. But I think our projection is that it'll probably be equal to what we put in this year or even less. Yeah. We have an extremely tight budget this year. If you remember back to our budget deliberations last year, um, you know, we worked very closely with the FinComs of both towns. They really tried to make the 11 percent that the committee was pushing for when they could do eight and a half. We mm -hmm. made it work without an override and I think yeah. and without laying people off. And as a result of that, it's a really tight budget. Yeah, which yeah. was excellent. Yeah. And speaking of the FinComs, do we want to give them an opportunity to 
give us a, an idea of where they stand, it, even if they don't know necessarily? How about if we finish going through? Oh, the sure. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Thanks. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We don't have much more, and then I think it would. Be, <coughs> uh, they're still he they're hearing this for the first time. Yep. Um, so um, the next section is section six, and these really outline the priorities that I was talking to you about when I was way back at section number one. But we've given you some background in terms of just what they are and why the administrative team and leadership team believe that these are so important. When we put the budget together, we work really hard to look at the three pillars of our strategic plan, and then for each pillar, we have annual action plans. And each one of these are linked to student-centered decisions that are made, and most all of them have financial considerations that go along with them. And as we had our discussion, uh, most recent meeting was just a couple weeks ago. It came out that our real priorities are solid curricular materials, making sure our students have the one-to-one -one devices um, that they need, and of course their social emotional issues. So what I've done in this section is we've just put together for you um, to look at what the various <coughs> things are that we've been looking at. Um, the first are the elementary science instructional supplies. As you know, I've talked about it, the Gelfand Foundation has generously provided over $400,000 in science resources. However, in order for children to learn science, it's a hands-on process. You can't do what I did way back in the 60s where you watch a little TV, black and white TV on a screen and think kids are going to grow up to become scientists. It's got to be hands-on. They've got to be making things, doing things, bringing them home. I'm sure those of you who have elementary students have seen the projects come home. Well, then you have to resupply those projects. So that's a cost, and it's now it's our turn to start paying for it. Um, the next are the Chromebooks. As you know, um, Chad's recommended $40,000 for the first year, and there's an extensive multi-year plan in this section to see how this can roll out. While it, maybe it would be ideal to put a Chromebook in every child's hand, a couple of issues with that. You want to make sure that the professional development has been done so they really are enhancing the curriculum. And you also want to make sure that we have the Wi-Fi capacity to be able to do it in the first place. So as we met as a group, it became very important to look at supplying classroom sets related to prioritized need. This way, with the $40,000 for the first year, that will prioritize direct curriculum projects that need to have those one-to-one -one devices and also the concern that Amy Fleck has brought to us that our kids are going to be writing on MCAS tests, high stakes tests on one-to-one -one <coughs> devices. And if they haven't been writing on them all year long, that's going to be a problem for our students. And we need to work with our staff on that as well. So that is the Chromebook initiative. We've talked this evening about the need for two special ed inclusion teachers, one at Hanson Middle, one at Whitman Middle to assist our students in science. Clearly the principals wanted two. I think that's not an unusual or out of line request, but I think we also can't keep pushing the budget higher. The family liaison that we've talked to you about, and for each one of these I've related them back to the pillars um, so that you get a sense of what those are. Other initiatives and priorities, and I think this is really up to the committee as to how we move forward with these. Um, the first one, of course, I've been working on this since 2000, no cost full day kindergarten. That's how long ago the very first grant was that was written, and we're still not there yet. Um, I estimate the cost of that would be just over a half a million dollars. <coughs> this will seem to you to be more than the proposal last year, and that's because we were able to uh, reduce a kindergarten teacher at the Duval School due to low enrollment. But we would clearly need to add that position back now if we went to full day because you can't get the two for one that you get with a half day teacher. So in order to do that, my estimate is it would be around 565,000. It could be less than that because there will be money when we finally do this in kindergarten revolving that will need to be spent. So very likely that money would be used to offset some of the costs for classroom supplies or refurbishing classrooms to do that. Um, Kevin, yeah, sure. um, does this take into account reducing the income that would come from charging 
yes. that we do now. That's where so you'll see um, in that chart where it says K revolving to LEA, K revolving to LEA. Okay. That takes us off the dependence of the revolving budget. Mm -hmm. okay. That's really where the lion's share cost of right. this is. Yeah. Because we've become dependent on that tuition to pay our salaries, <laughs> and you can only use that tuition to pay salaries. So if you're going to go to no cost, you've either got to just allocate it above and beyond, or you've got to continually wean yourself off that money. And that's hard to do when we have so many other needs. But that, yeah, mm -hmm. Kevin, that's yes. what it is. Thank you. Uh, there would be a reduced cost because you wouldn't have a half day run uh, for the buses, and we projected that at just over um, 66,000. Mm -hmm. um, realigning starting times is the other thing we've talked about. Um, Diane Naughton did some extensive work for us on that. Estimates it would cost about $417,000 to do that. Um, we've talked a lot about the foreign language program and as recently as just a week or two ago, what happens if we just add one teacher, one teacher over time? It really doesn't become a robust foreign language program. Mm -hmm. In order to have the foreign language program that I think our middle school kids deserve, you'd need to add probably five teachers at Whitman Middle and three at Hanson Middle. Okay. Significant expense. Mm -hmm. um, talked also about instrumental music. Um, right now, I'm paying a very low stipend to a very highly qualified person. If you went to our all band night, if you're fortunate enough to do that, um, just last week, the elementary band was stellar, absolutely stellar. They even played Star Wars, and it used to be like Mary Had a Little Lamb. So that's pretty good for four months of instrumental music. It's good. Uh, but at this point, we're really just nursing this along. We're not, we don't have a program. We have something that could fall apart at a moment's mm -hmm. notice. Um, so I think that's something to think about as well. And as I've said, that position's been gone now for 11 years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the next piece is the Chromebook initiative that Chad put together. And as you can see, he did it as a multi-year initiative. And this basically looks at leasing Chromebooks over mm -hmm. a period of time so you're constantly <coughs> replenishing old with new, old with new, so that you're not stuck with a bunch of aging uh, pieces of equipment. I really commend him for the tremendous amount of effort um, that he put into this. If you have questions about this, we're going to answer those at the meeting on the 28th when he'll be back with us. But um, suffice it to say that for this year, we'd be looking at an increase of $40,000 to begin to do this. But you can see he takes it all the way out to 2026, where very likely it won't be called a Chromebook anymore. By mm -hmm. then it'll be something else, but clearly we need to pay attention um, to the one-to-one -one technology. So we really wanted to help you understand why we came up with the priorities that we did. Uh, we have a staffing section for you. Um, not gonna go through that. You can certainly look at that on your own time. And then the last is um, capital improvement. And we included this, even though it's not really part of the operating budget because it's really an important part of what we do and also to show you the impact of what happens when you do take a school offline. So uh, Christine and Ernie have worked together to break this down so that you can see what the various projects are. Clearly our subcommittee has been involved with this all the way along so that you get a sense of what the capital costs truly are. What is a capital project? We've answered those varieties of things. But I think most importantly is if you look at the very last question, how does the closing of Maquan School impact capital projects? Mm -hmm. By taking Maquan offline, capital costs, which would be costs going to the taxpayers in Hanson, would total, and I think it's a conservative, $5 million. Mm -hmm. The other piece that goes along with that are also the unanticipated costs which have been over a half a million dollars in three years. And that is something like the boys' bathroom on the second floor leaking into the first floor, 20 plus thousand dollars. <clears throat> That's the boiler shutting down several weeks ago. That's another cost. There are all these things that will now go away. Unanticipated costs, as well as the known costs that we knew were going to be needed to keep that a safe school environment. So we thought that was important. And then we also outlined for you on page 78 just what those capital repairs have been. And the book ends with just a, an outline of 
an updated outline of the capital costs. And I don't know, Christine, if you want to add anything about capital and how it's been revised, it might be helpful. Um, so these are what we call the capital matrix. So first we have the town of Hanson, which Ruth just alluded to how it's only a one page, it's one page now because we have taken off just just under $5 million or around $5 million of cap that we of capital costs that we would be looking at if we did, did not close Maquan. Then the next one <coughs> is the um, capital at the town of Whitman. Um, and then the next one is here at the high school, the regional district-wide capital planning. And we've tried to outline those as accurately as we can. Right. And the, these are a living document because they can change. We can, you know, Ernie, Ernie and his team can de determine that there's something else that needs to be fixed. At so if this is ever evolving, right? It sure is. Yep. On a daily basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, that um, is our our budget that we're presenting to you this evening. So we're happy to entertain any questions. And I know Steve, you had the question. If yes. you wanted to hear from the FinCom. Oh, absolutely. Before you hear from the FinCom, I'll give you a little snapshot in layman's terms. What I've been kind of doing here, you've probably seen me, I've got the calculator going. If you took a budget that is $2,674,821 increase, and the school committee so voted, and I'm just giving you hypothetical terms, to take $500,000 off of that budget, that would leave you with a balance of $2,174,821. To balance it, the towns would have to be assessed 10.76%, and that would balance the 2174000 If they went to 8.5%, which graciously they did last year, it would still leave a negative $457,000 deficit. So it's just putting in terms of where it was last year versus where it is this year versus your two assessments. I, I think that may be hopeful for you. I mean, for you to do it on your own. It's about 202, 202,000 per 1%. So if you quickly go through it, and if you look in the book, there is a chart that yeah, we, we have provided. The chart there that, and if you we'll take the 2,674,000 2, and just deduct 500, and I can't speak for the committee, but I'm, say, I'm just using that hypothetically. hypothetically yeah. It's a $2.1 million deficit. Mm -hmm. Take 200,000, 202,000 times every point, and that's where I came up with the figures. Right. It's a little bit easier. I know it was very detailed, this budget, but those are the true hard layman's they are. terms. It's the reality, right? The reality of what it's, where it really is right. if this budget stays exactly where it is now. And, and I think, you know, any, you know, I think you were a little optimistic that state aid might improve somewhat. So any of that, you know, in terms of regional transportation, circuit breaker, the reimbursements, those kinds of things, that would help tremendously too. Yeah. So I think a combination of um, really looking at state aid, I really wouldn't, you know, more per pupil in terms of Chapter 70 would help. I think if it was another $50, you said that was going to... Uh, or 200000 That's Yeah, so yeah, any of... 188 I Yeah, think so any of that certainly will help as well. So it's really working with both our towns as well as at the state level to try to get, the, get rid of this budget cap. Any questions? Good evening, Rick Anderson, uh, Women Finance Committee. Steve, I don't know specifically your question. Um, the Women Finance Committee is currently meeting with uh, departments and uh, reviewing their budgets, and we are scheduled with the uh, district for in two weeks to meet with them. Okay. So appreciate the opportunity to have this information to bring back to them early and formulate some questions okay. in advance of our meeting. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I didn't know if you knew, like, from revenues what you were already looking at or if you see anything that, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's still. Free cash is so out of whack or um, new growth. We're, we're facing some pretty significant challenges in the town of Whitman, so. Okay. But it's still early in the process, so we really don't have anything concrete to, to review. All right. Appreciate right. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Rick. You, Rick. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. As you know, we will be discussing this as we always do. This is just the opening night to give you sort of a snapshot of where we are currently. 
we're going to be crunching the numbers also and looking at different things that we want to do and change but those numbers we just gave you of the total picture i hope that by what i just gave you it, it summarizes an easier way to figure it because sometimes an opening night of budget it gets very difficult you walk out of here going what and if you just figure every point of assessment at 202,000, it gives you a much easier snapshot of where we are. So, Mr. McGann. Kudos for full day kindergarten. I'm really glad you guys put that in place. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. No, the dollar amount is not, it's just a priority. Mm -hmm. um, before we, before we move just on. Curious on that. that that is not in this budget. No, only if you all decided that's we should put it in. Next to the list. Yeah. And, and the Chromebooks are not. Yes. You know. Chromebook the forty thousand. Oh, the Chromebook is in. Is in. Okay. That you'll see that, Mike. If you look at it's almost the last yeah, page of all of it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. So that the, that's in. Yeah. Perhaps. Can you clarify just you know so everyone's on the same page? It's level services plus. The Chromebooks, the two special ed teachers, the family liaison, and structural materials for no Adam. Yeah, I mean, you could That's look at it that way, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And it's worth But it's also, yeah. of course, taking into account we're taking a building offline and, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. That's why to call it that was, we felt probably was maybe a misnomer, but it gives you a sense well, of how the money The services works. we're getting plus these and items. And really trying to enhance services that way. That's right. We need correct. to enhance. You know, well, the, I think the feeling of, of our leadership team was that we have to move forward. Mm -hmm. We can't just keep doing the same thing we've always done. And we've also looked at some of the things we do do. And we, you know, have reduced things. We've not filled retirements due to some of the declining enrollment, yeah. um, you know, over time. <clears throat> Before I forget this evening, and this is not on a budget thing, as we were talking about Mass Mu Music Educators Association, mm -hmm. they are donating $500. I would enter up, it, it reads, we'll receive up to $500. I'd entertain a motion to accept that as a gift. So, so move. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Why is there never any discussion on taking money in? No, no. <laughs> just say thank you, right? Exactly. <laughs> Anyone have any other questions before I entertain a motion to adjourn? Do we have to come out of the public, public, hearing? public hearing? Yeah, I'm going to come out of that in a second. Yeah. And entertain a motion to come out of the public hearing? So moved. Second. Yes. 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 Okay, the public hearing for the budget is now closed. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? <clears throat> Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks. It's great to see so many people here this evening.